to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ never ever give up the Word of God encourages every Christian to never, ever give up. And one of the great things about our awesome God is that He equips every child of His to live in such a way that He never has to give up. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today, our final lesson in our series of lessons on Our God is an Awesome God. And today we're thinking about how God perfectly equips his children for faithfulness. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and congregations of the churches of Christ in your area. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a, a Bible question, you'd like to know more about worship or why they do some of the things they do or the plan of salvation or the church, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. You'll find people at the Lord's Church who love God, who love souls, and you will be an honored guest in any of their assemblies. And so we want to encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, all of our material on our website, thegospelofchrist.com, all our material is available to you 24-7, free of charge. Our lessons, our audio lessons, DVDs, transcripts, study questions, we make that all available to you free of charge. In fact, if you need a copy of that, you can get a digital download uh, for your computer, or if you'd like to have a hard copy, we'll be happy to send you a DVD or a CD free of charge as well. We want men and women. Here's our aim at the Gospel of Christ. We want to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we're concerned about people going to heaven. That's the motive for which we give these lessons and the main import of our evangelistic efforts. And so today, we're thinking about the idea of God perfectly equipping His people for faithfulness. And as we mentioned, that's something God wants. Revelation 2 verse 10, Jesus said, Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. First Timothy 6 verse 12, and toward the close of Paul's life, Paul would say, I have fought the good fight of faith. Second Timothy 4 verses 6 through 8. In fact, in Galatians 6, 9 and 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24, it is Paul who said, not everyone who enters a race wins, it run, uh, not everyone who runs a race wins, but only one wins. And then he would say, in essence, run the Christian race in such a way that you may, be, that you may win. You know, as we think about this idea today, it'd be very easy in the situation we're in for a Christian to get discouraged. And the circumstances we find ourselves in the world today, it'd be very easy for a a Christian to be uh, discouraged and maybe even want to give up. Think about all that we're going through right now. You've got a virus that has wreaked havoc on our world. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost because of it. Millions of people have been infected by it. Jobs, homes, school, all that is so far removed from the norm right now. Then on top of that, culturally and socially, there's so much uh, hatred and, and anger and uh, things that are going wrong in our world. And then you put the day-to-day -day stress with that, living faithfully to the Lord, helping our families to do right, making sure that we our jobs and everything's going well with them. Just the massive amount of stress that people are under today, it'd be very easy for a person to get discouraged and think about throwing in the towel or giving up. But here's what I want you to think about. Think about, for just a moment, how different the world would be if every person who hit a little bit of a rough patch just gave up. Uh, let me give you some examples of people who maybe hit some rough patches, but we're sure glad they didn't give up and they kept uh, stayed true to what they were going to do. For example, did you know that the imagination genius 
Walt Disney was fired from his first job at the Kansas City Star. The editor of the Kansas City Star actually had this to say about why he fired Walt Disney. He said these exact words, he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Aren't you glad Walt Disney didn't throw in the towel right now, right then? He, he stayed true to his purpose and he kept pressing forward. Uh, Thomas Edison was told by a third grade teacher, you're too stupid to learn anything. Now friends, that's the person who held a thousand patents, who invented the phonograph and the light bulb. Aren't you glad when he'd hit a little bit of a rough patch and faced some discouragement, he didn't give up? And then I think of Elvis Presley. After one of his first performances on the Grand Ole Opry, Elvis Presley was told this, Son, you ain't ever going to amount to nothing. You need to go back to driving a truck. Well, aren't you glad that he didn't give up? that he stayed true, that he stayed determined, and that the discouragement didn't get him down. And so today, what we hope to offer is encouragement for every one of us to never give up in the fact that God equips us. God perfectly equips every one of us to be faithful unto Him. And so, how are we going to do that? What can I do? How has the Lord equipped me? And how has the Lord equipped you to stay faithful? First, I need to realize ahead of time that there are evil forces that are enticing me to give up. If I can know ahead of time that not everybody's cheering me on, not everybody's patting me on the back, and there are going to be people and things that try to discourage me, if I can know what those are and be aware of them, that'll help me not to be allured by their temptation. Now, we're going to mention three specifically today. Satan, of course, is the main force. Then we're also going to talk about how the world and our difficulties sometimes try to get in the way of us running the race. But friend, from the, get, from the outset, let's realize Satan is doing everything possible to tempt me and to tempt you. Would you open your Bible to Luke chapter 22, verse 31 with me? I want you to look at Luke chapter 22 verse number 31, and I want you to see how Satan is actively trying to pursue God's people and get them to give up today. Luke 22, 31, the Bible says this, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And Jesus would say, But I've prayed for you that your faith would not falter or fail. Friend, I can assure you today that right where Simon's name is, I can put mine and you can put yours. Satan is the main force trying to discourage people today. Let me illustrate. Mark 4, verse 15, we've got the parable of the sower. And some seed is thrown by the wayside and it's immediately snatched up. Who did that? Satan immediately takes away the word when the seed is sown. Jesus said in Mark 4, verse 15, Paul said in 1 Timothy 5, 15, some have already turned aside to Satan. They, they hadn't been in it long, but they'd already turned aside to Satan. And then Paul himself would say in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, we wanted to come to you time and time again. But then he says this, but Satan hindered us. Uh, we're not to be ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Satan is the one who ultimately entered Judas's heart. Luke 22, verse 3. And so all these passages and, and verses are trying to impress upon our heart. Satan is an aggressive, active adversary who's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Don't let him get into your life. Friend, I promise you this. All the evil... All the calamity, all the sickness, all the death, all the hatred and anger that's out there. The one person who's standing in the background cheering all that on is Satan. But here's the good news today. Unless you let him, Satan cannot win. Oh, he's an active adversary. Yes, he's pursuing every one of us. But the good news is every child of God can overcome Satan with the Lord's help. How do we know that? Would you look in your New Testament to 1 John chapter 4, and I want you to look in verse number 4. You are of, little, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Notice this, don't miss this point, because He who is in you is greater 
than he who is in the world. Friend, I have the power through God and through Christ to overcome Satan. Uh, 1 John 5 verse 4, this is the victory we have, even our faith. And the good news is, ultimately, finally, Satan's already been defeated. Hebrews 2 verse 14, Jesus through death overcame him the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus has defeated Satan and I have the power. We have the power to overcome him because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Then there's a second evil force that we've got to be aware of and it's this. This old world is also trying to entice us and allure us to give up. Friend, there's a lot of things in this world that are beautiful, that are attractive, and there's things that a Christian can partake of, and, and those be wholesome and right. But it's also the case that if we're not careful, we can get so attached to this world that it can make us lose focus and get us off track. I know that's the case because of these people. Luke 17, 32 makes this very poignant statement, very simple statement. Remember Lot's wife. What do you want me to remember? God told Lot and his family to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, when you leave out of that city, don't look back or you're going to turn to a pillar of salt. Lot's wife had to have that one last glimpse and she turned to a pillar of salt. Think about another individual who the world allured him into losing focus. Solomon was given wisdom from on high by God. In the book of 1 Kings, he was given wisdom more than any man that we know of. And yet he squandered that. In 1 Kings 10 and 11, Solomon has uh, 300 wives, 700 concubines. He is up on the hilltop building uh, temples to their false gods and worshiping with them. His heart was not where it needed to be with God. What happened to Solomon? The world, all the attraction, all the allurement pulled him away from God. And then probably the clearest example of all. I wish we could find more people with this kind of question. The rich young ruler came to Jesus in Mark 10 verses 17 through 22. And he said, great question. Good teacher, uh, we know that you're sent from God. No one can do the things you do unless God is with him. And uh, he, he asked Jesus a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. All those things I've done from my childhood. One thing you lack, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. You know what the very next verse says? That man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He let his stuff and all the things of this world and the attractions keep him from really putting Christ first. 2 Timothy 4 verse 10, uh, Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, the world is not so overt in the way that it tries to allure us. It's more, um, it's more in the background, as it were. Let me give you an illustration. I like to garden and plant and like messing with plants and things like that. And I remember one time, my wife and I were living in Oklahoma City and I uh, was at a home department store there. And right up by the counter, I saw a Venus flytrap. And I thought, this is really cool. Everybody gets flies in their house every now and then. So having a plant that would actually eat flies, man, that is so neat. And so I bought the plant. And I began to look into it. And the way that works is really unique. It kind of looks like a, a dead animal laying on its back with its feet up. And the inside of it is red and bright green colors. And so uh, what it looks like attracts the animal. And then it also puts off certain amount of smell that smells like a really ripe, juicy fruit. And that then that fly flies into the Venus flytrap and it does not immediately, real quickly, clamp down on it. It has to have 20 sensory movements before it even begins to close. And then it just kind of closes slowly. How in the world does that plant uh, attract that fly? Not with the, it doesn't come to it with a ball and chain that it's going to trap it with, but slowly, real carefully, over time, it does that. Well, friend, isn't that the way the world works by alluring us? Someone says, well, that's all good and well, but we've got to live here and be a part of the world. How do we keep that from taking advantage of us? Friend, as we think about the allurement of the world, please understand this. We've got to remember and be reminded what our most valuable possession is. I want you to look at the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Look in Mark chapter 8 with me, verses 36 and 37. How do I not get pulled in 
by all the allurements and attractions of this world? Remember what's most important. Jesus said, For what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I need to remember what's most valuable, and that is my soul. All the stuff and junk of this world isn't going to amount to anything compared to my eternal soul, which is going to be somewhere forever, and I need to make sure I live in such a way that I live with God. And then a third evil force is this. Sometimes the calamity, the sickness, and the difficulty that we have gets in our lives and makes us think we cannot finish the race. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul said, A thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to beat me. If anybody ever had any difficulty, the apostle Paul did. Think about what Job went through. Lost all of his wealth, lost all ten of his children, lost his, his health. His wife stays around and tells him to curse God and die. And Job had the faith to say this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Friend, as you watch this lesson, no doubt there are people who are facing difficulty. You're facing sickness maybe. You're facing calamity. Maybe some dreaded disease. How do we keep that from letting us, getting us down and, and making us want to give up? Friend, here's how. Don't miss this. Remember, no matter what you face, heaven is going to be worth it all. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to Romans 8, verse number 18. The calamity, the sickness, the disease, the difficulty that we face, it doesn't even begin to compare with how beautiful heaven's going to be. Look in Romans chapter 8, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 18. Paul says these beautiful words. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul had been beaten. Paul had some thorn in the flesh. Paul faced a lot of difficulty. And, and no doubt there were people who died that Paul knew because they were Christians. And Paul said the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worthy to be compared. They're not a drop in the bucket compared to the glory that's one day going to be revealed in us. And so as we think about these ideas, friend, let's realize the world, let's realize Satan, let's realize that difficulties are going to try to get in the way. Don't let them. You have the power to overcome them. Then we also have this to help us. We have been given divine help by God to never give up. I mentioned real briefly three helps that the Christian has. The Christian has the help of the Word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 12, this Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in Matthew 4, He said every time, it is written, it is written, it is written. And Psalm 119 verse 50 says, this has been my comfort in my affliction. Your Word has given me hope. Then I have the help of the example of Jesus. Uh, think about what the Lord went through. I'm to follow in his footsteps everything Christ faced. They called him chief of the devils in Mark chapter 3. They made fun of him on the cross when he was there dying for them. He lived that perfect life. Everything he went through, his example empowers me. And then a third help we have is this. We have each other. We encourage and we help each other in this life. I want you to think about a passage with me, and then we're going to look at a verse together. You know, since we've been isolated some recently, and since we haven't been around people as much, and, and uh, one of the things that it really reminded me of, especially as a child of God trying to run the Christian race, is we need each other to help get to heaven. Exodus 17, verses 11 through 13 is a beautiful picture. God's people are fighting the Amalekites. And here's what God says to him. He says, God says, as long as Moses holds up his hands, you're going to win the battle. And so they start out fighting. Moses has got his hands up. Uh, they're winning the battle. They're defeating the Amalekites. But as you can imagine, Moses kind of gets tired. 
And so as his hands get tired and he starts to let them down, they begin to lose the battle. And so they think, we've got to do whatever it takes to help Moses hold his hands up. And so here's what they do. They get Aaron on one side, his brother. They get her on the other side. They hold Aaron's hands up, Moses' hands up. They place supports under them. And both men stand right there with Moses and they assist him and they aid him in holding his hands up. What do we learn from that? We need the help of each other to make it through this life. All right, let's look at that passage together. Hebrews chapter 3. I want you to look in verses 12 and 13 that illustrates we need the encouragement and the help from each other. Apostle Paul says, or the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 3, beginning in verse number 12, these words. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort or encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We have the Word of God. We have the example of Jesus. We have our Christian family. Let's use the tools God has given us to overcome and to be faithful in this life and to make sure we make it to heaven. Now, here's the third thing we can do. Realize there are evil forces. Don't let them get to you. Use the help God's aided you with and... Thirdly, focus on the motivations to never give up. Two words we want to highlight here. The first is this. Remember the joy of being a Christian. Remember how good it is to be a child of God and the great joy that we can have. Philippians 4 verse 4, the Apostle Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In Acts 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas are in a deep, dark dungeon in Philippi. And what are they doing? Moping and pouting and whining? No. They're praying and they're singing hymns to God. And the prisoners are listening to them. They had joy even in that dark dungeon. Friend, here's what we've got to remember. As a child of God, I've overcome sin. Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin. I've got to realize as a child of God, I can take joy in the fact that the devil has been defeated through Christ. He, through death, overcame him who had the power of death. And friend, I've got to realize, I can have great joy in the fact that I've been given a second chance. Listen to this beautiful verse. Here's what the Word of God says. The Word of God says this. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. And then the second word, on top of remembering the joy, secondly, we'd say focus on this motivation. Determine more than anything in all the world to go to heaven and to win the race. Determine. Make, a, make a, 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 a conscious decision that no matter what, I'm going to go to heaven. You know, when we think about this idea, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Don't set your mind on things of the earth. Set your mind on heaven, he would say. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 21, Jesus would say, He who overcomes, in essence, can come over and live with me. Don't you want to go to that place where the Lord is? Don't you want to go to that place where there's no more sin, sorrow, and death, and all the former things have passed away? Make a conscious determination and be motivated to never let anything get in the way of going to heaven. There's two quotes I want to think about with you today as we bring our, our ideas to a close, and it's this. As it relates to determination, there was a Carthaginian general by the name of Hannibal Barca, who said this. He said, and, and here's the context, context of what's going on. At this point in time, in the third and fourth century, the Romans are basically defeating everybody, except Hannibal Barca and the Carthaginians. He defeats them three, if not four times. How did he do that? It wasn't because he had more men and more power. It was through determination. Here's what he's remembered for. He made this statement. Hannibal Barca said, we will either find a way or we'll make one. Friend, can't the Christian say that about God? God will either find a way or God will make one, right? I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me and so determined more than anything in all the world that God will find a way, God will make one, and that I can ultimately make it to heaven. And then I want to close with this thought. As we think about, friend, we all understand that from time to time it gets difficult. And as we think about God equipping His people to win the race, when, when we do get discouraged and when we do face challenges, here's a quote I want you to remember. President Franklin D. Roosevelt made this statement, and I've always loved the words that he said here, and especially the, the image that he tied with it. He said this. He said, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Friend, that's what we're trying to encourage, encourage each one of us with today. Are there evil forces that are working against us? Sure. Don't throw in the towel. Tie that knot and hang on. Is it the case that we have the tools to win the battle? Absolutely. Tie a knot and hang on. Don't give up. Yes, there's going to be challenges. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. Uh, everything may not perfectly go my way or your way every day like for I'd like for it to, but rather than slipping off in that rope or throwing in the towel, hang on. Don't give up is the idea. And so, friend, we ask you today, are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? The only way you can make it, friend, I don't know how people make it through this life if they're not children of God. If you're not a child of God, we hope that the, the promises and the benefits we've shown today will encourage you to be one. Have you heard the gospel message that there is a Savior? His name is Jesus Christ and He will save His people from their sins. Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21. Do you believe that? Are you willing to commit to a life of following Christ? Acts chapter 3 verse 19, we're told to repent and turn again. Would you repent of sin and turn to God in faith? Would you make the great confession? Matthew 10 verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And to have every sin washed away, to enter into Christ, would you be baptized? Galatians 3 verse 27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ, then rising out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life and to be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 verse number 10. We're so glad you joined us today and may God help each of us to live our lives in such a way that we never give up and that we make it to heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.